and welcome back to Scarred for Life, the podcast where we open up old wounds by looking back at the films that scared us as kids. I'm Terry. And I'm Mary Beth. In each episode, our special guest brings with them a movie that traumatized them as a child. This week, we are very excited. Our guest is Kayla Janice. She is a film writer, programmer, producer, and the founder of the Miskatonic Institute for Horror Studies. Her debut feature as a director, the documentary Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched, a history of folk horror, premiered last year at South by Southwest and is currently streaming on Shutter. And her book, House of Psychotic Women, an autobiographical topography of female neurosis in horror and exploitation films, is celebrating its 10-year anniversary with a newly updated edition coming this October. Welcome to the show! Hello, thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us. And is there some, and is there anything you haven't done? Because I feel like you've run the <laughs> gamut when it comes to film. Well, I, yeah, I move around a lot. I think it's just a way to sort of keep being inspired by things, yeah. you know, is like, I kind of do things in like little spurts or little cycles and then come back to things I was doing before. And I think it's just a way for me to just keep things fresh all the time, but still be utilizing my whatever gathered expertise from things. So oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So take a, take us back to the very beginning. How did you get introduced to horror? From my parents, like a lot of people, it was, um, I mean, one of my earliest memories, I talk about it in my book, House of Psychotic Women, was um, sitting on the floor in the den at my grandmother's house and the Saturday afternoon creature feature was on. I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, and so we got a lot of, uh, well, almost all of our TV was American television coming from mm. Detroit. And, you know, there were a lot of horror shows. There was like a couple different horror hosts and stuff like that. And, and so this particular Saturday morning, the movie Horror Express was playing. And that was not uh, something I, I didn't know. I didn't catch the title at the time. You know, it was it took me until I was like 19 or something when I fi randomly rented the movie. And then I was like, Oh, my God, this is the movie. Um, but I, I was like, you know, so my parents obviously were watching that film at my grandmother's house and mm -hmm. um and it was just a thing like my both of my parents were into horror my mom was way more into like thrillers and movie of the week type of horror and she loved Stephen King and Ira Levin and all the kind of blockbustery yeah. horror people you know of the 70s and 80s and then my dad on the other hand liked old stuff so he liked old AIP films and Hammer films, you know. And so kind of like between the both of them, I got a lot of, diff, you know, different horror knowledge. And my dad got so excited about, I remember us watching movies late at night and he'd be like, whoa, Christopher Lee, whoa, Peter Cushing. You know, like he would say everybody's name when the, when the credits showed in the movie. And he would be so excited that then I was excited about Peter Cushing. You know, like I just, yep. it was uh, contagious, you know. So yeah, so I just, I've been a horror fan for as far, literally as far back as I can remember. <laughs> you know, I think, I think Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, like, spawned generations upon generations of <laughs> horror fans, because my dad was the same way, like, he loved the Universal Monsters, but then he also yeah. loved anything that had Peter Cushing in it, or Christopher Lee, we were watching. Yeah. And so we ran the gamut from, like, good stuff, and to Dra horror of Dracula, to, like, some of the bad stuff that they did, like, just yeah. the whole gamut. Yeah. Yeah, no, my dad was, it was kind of funny because my dad, and this is my stepdad I'm talking about, but he, um, <laughs> he didn't like a lot of the newer horror because he thought there was like too much swearing. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't even necessarily about the violence or anything. It was like, mm -hmm. for some reason, he, he just didn't like swearing, you know? So my mom was the one I would watch the more sweary movies with. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's always weird what, what, what strikes parents. Cause like. I mean, for this isn't probably surprising, but for my parents, it was nudity. Like, that was, like, a big yeah. stopping ground. It was like, watch all the violent stuff you want, but if there are boobies on on screen, nah. -uh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that was actually the case with both of my parents, too. Nudity oh. was, no. <laughs> yeah. I watched American Psycho at a 
incredibly inappropriate age with my family because I was like the baby in a family of very young people. So like, ah, fuck it. She'll be fine. And who, there's a, like an, a threesome scene that they're like, mm-hmm. okay, you have to go into the bathroom for this one. But I could watch <laughs> all of the other horrendous torture scenes, but the, the threesome scene, I had to go into the bathroom, but I, wa- yeah. I, I figured out how to do mirrors and angles <laughs> so I could watch it from the mirror of yeah. the bathroom. Cause I had to know if you tell me I can't watch it. Now I really have to see what it is gotta see it (laughs) i think parents just think and i don't know if this is correct but i think they think that like children have a language for violence from a young age they know what violence is and they understand what it is and so i feel as though they feel like this is not going to be a confusing concept to us that someone is hitting another person but the idea of people having sex if it's something they haven't really explained to us yet it's sort of like they're so really uncomfortable with Mm -hmm. uh the ways that might traumatize us and be like totally confusing to us, you know? So I think that's something to do with the comfort more parents have with their kids watching violence than sex is they feel like kids are just already, they're always like hitting people and hitting things. And it's kind (laughs) of like, you know, I think they're like, well, kids understand violence, you know? (laughs) Yeah. True. So was horror express your first horror movie you ever saw? Or do you have, is there another one that was the first one you remember seeing? Horror express is definitely the first one I remember. I I mean, I would have been like three. So this is very, very early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So were you a scared kid growing up? Like did movies actually scare you or were you more fascinated with them? They definitely scared me when I was little. Um, they, they didn't off, they didn't often scare me while I was watching them though, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't usually like covering my eyes or anything like that, but I was more, (laughs) um, when I would be alone later, I would get scared, you know? So I was afraid of the dark. I was afraid of my closet. I was afraid of my toys. I was afraid of like a picture hanging on the wall. I was afraid of like everything, (laughs) But it was only like later when I was alone and I would start thinking about all the stuff from the movie. Like I remember after I saw Poltergeist, you know, and the scene with the clown, I had to get all, yeah. all my toys out of my room. You know? <laughs> yeah. Poltergeist, uh, I, can, I, I still get wary of closets from Poltergeist. Like I yeah. was terrified of my closet. That was your scarred for life moment. It was my scarred for life <laughs> moment. I will not wow. like I could not. Have, I couldn't be facing my my back facing to my closet or anything. Like I was convinced it was a portal to another yeah. hell world. So yeah, oh yeah, Caroline. fuck that movie in a great way. I mean that, but fuck that movie. <laughs> so what what were some of your favorites? Would you say growing up as a kid, some of your horror favorites? Uh, Carrie for sure. Okay, Ca- mm-hmm. Carrie was a big one from a young age. Um, because I just loved Carrie White. I also read the book of Carrie quite young as well. Like oh. I was allowed to read Stephen King books really young and I learned how to read really early. Like I was already reading before I was in school. Oh, wow. So oh, cool. I, I okay. learned to read way, I had a brother three years older than me and I learned to read way before he did. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was like reading novels by the time I was like six. Dang. Oh my so God. And my mom would like pa- pass me down her like Stephen King books and stuff. So I read Carrie really young and I just like loved her character and, you know, and then I saw the movie. I'm pretty sure I read the book first. So I loved Carrie and I also loved Salem's Lot. Mm. In, but the main reason I love Salem's Lot was because of Lance Kerwin's character, Mark Petrie, who's like the horror fan character. Yes. Because, I mean, for one thing, Lance Kerwin in the 70s was huge. He was like a huge teen actor and so he was on all the cover of all the teen magazines, and I collected all these magazines. So I had, like, you know, shirtless pictures of <laughs> Lance Kerwin on my wall and stuff. And uh, and then in this movie, he's playing a horror fan, you know? So he was, like, he had his own TV show called James at 15, and between that and a lot of, like, after-school specials and stuff, that was how I knew him. But then when Salem's Lot came out, he's playing a horror fan, and he uses his horror fandom, his knowledge of horror tropes and creatures and stuff that he's learned from this like nerdy activity (laughs) uh, to basically be the surviving, to be the survivor and to like sit, you know, fight the monster and stuff. And so that was a big deal for me too, to see that kind of validation. So it was like the guy that I had a massive crush on from TV. (laughs) Plus he was like validating my taste, you know, right. 
<laughs> and so as in the, so like as you've kind of obviously been a very devoted horror fan growing up does horror still scare you at all like do you still get scared of are there movies that still scare you uh i would say there's i still don't get scared hardly ever watching a film but i will sometimes still get scared later okay. you know um so i will I remember once, I don't know what it was, I saw there was like a version of The Turn of the Screw with Patsy Kensett that came out, I think, in the 90s. And for some reason, after I finished watching the film, Mm -hmm. uh, I had rented it, whatever. I was like terrified. I was terrified to be alone in the house because of something in that movie. And I don't remember like what it was. Because obviously I've seen many different ver- adaptations right. of yeah. that story, but for whatever reason, something in that movie terrified me. And I remember being really scared afterwards and having to sleep with my light on. And oh, this wow. is like, you know, I would have been like 28 years old, right. like an adult. So um, actually the um, the Nightmare, the Rodney Asher movie about people who have sleep paralysis, I had to sleep with my lights on for like three <laughs> nights after I saw that movie because... I was like in the theater at the Toronto Film Festival or Hot Docs or something in Toronto. And, uh, you know, so he we watch the movie and everybody in the movie that's interviewed starts talking about how it's like weirdly contagious where like mm. somebody has sleep paralysis and then they start telling their partner about it. And then their partner starts having sleep paralysis. And there's this thing of like, yeah, it's weird. Like when you tell other people about it, they start to have it too. So then Rodney Asher comes up to do the Q&A at the end. And he's like, how many people in this room have sleep paralysis? And half the pe- everybody around me puts their hands up. And I'm like, oh, my God, now I'm going to get it, you know. And so I just went home and I just, like, couldn't sleep. I had to just keep my lights on. I was, like, trying not to fall asleep. <laughs> so, and this is, like, I don't know, when did that movie come out? Like, five years ago? Yeah, so it wasn't this, that long yeah, ago. So, like, I still get scared from movies. But it, but as with when I was a kid, it happens later, usually when I'm alone. Did you ever have a night terror after that? No, thankfully. Okay. Thankfully. But I still think I had about my, it. I had my first one recently, and it was a fucking night. It was a, Do obviously a nightmare. Do not tell me about it. it. Yeah. Don't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Mary Beth, did I give it to you? Because I had my very first one last year. Remember? Oh my God, we have to stop this. We can't keep talking about this. <laughs> no, thank you. I never want so to let's, have Anyway, again. something, let's change yeah. the subject. Anyway, uh, yeah, moving, moving on, on from that. Horror movies. Oh, uh, God. What, so what are some of your favorites as an adult? What would you say are like some the quintessential horror movies for uh, you? Well, still Carrie. I still love Carrie. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love Everything up until the ending of Hereditary. Oh, oh not a fan of the ending, huh? Not a fan of the ending, but I love that movie up until the ending. You know, like, I mean, I just feel like Tony Collette's fucking vitriol, you know, like she has the that oh fucking my God. look on your fucking face. <laughs> yes. I mean, she's so good and it's so scary and it's so disturbing the way that, I mean, like his movies are disturbing, you know, but it's like. But I've, it's just the the brother, you know, when they have the accident and then he just like goes upstairs oh. and goes to bed, like, oh, like just moment. does not, how do you tell your parents that uh-huh. you did this? You just have to like hide under the covers and then the, yeah, oh my God. So yeah, I mean, I oh. find that movie amazing, but, but I mean like his, his short film that he made before <gasps> yes. that was called like, oh, what was it? What's wrong with the... Andersons or something like that. The strange thing about the Johnsons. Okay. Yes. Yes. So it was one of the most disturbing movies I've ever seen, you know? So like... I've never seen it. (laughs) You've never seen it? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is unlike anything you have ever experienced. Let me tell you. It's on YouTube. I think it's on YouTube or Vimeo. Don't watch it with your family members. (laughs) Not a family viewing experience, that is for sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. (laughs) But so, Kayla, you've done... Um, a million things in horror, and it's incredible. But the first thing I wanted to ask you about is, can you tell our listeners a little bit about House of Psychotic Women for people who may not be familiar with the book? Sure. It's, um, well, it kind of does what it says on the package. It's an autobiographical topography <laughs> of female neurosis in horror and exploitation films. But Which is to say that it's a book of sort of horror film criticism or horror analysis 
um, but filtered through my own autobiographical stories and anecdotes. Um, and so this was, I mean, I feel as though that structure is pretty common now in writing, like even in horror writing, there are other books that are like about people's personal experiences with horror that are kind of similar, but back then it was, it was pretty maligned to insert yourself in, in the criticism like that. And, uh, and it, yeah, so it's basically, it's talking about incidents from my life and navigating it's kind of like me navigating these incidences with the help of analyzing the films. So it's almost like analyzing the films becomes a way of analyzing that experience that I had, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's quite candid and personal. I remember when I first sent some of my friends the manuscript to look at, they thought it was too personal. They were like, oh my God, you don't want to put that out in the world, you know? And I was really worried when I put it out that people would just like make fun of me, you know, for being so, so vulnerable, like, especially in the context of yeah. writing about horror movies, you know? Yeah. But I mean, I had run a film festival years ago, like in the late nineties and early two thousands, I ran a film fest, a horror film festival in Vancouver called Cine Muerte. And I remember some of the customers would complain that, uh, the movies I picked were too, like too sad. <laughs> You know, that I always picked, like, really sad, depressing horror movies. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I was, and I feel like my book was kind of like, it's like, yes, because I think I get stuff out of horror movies that are not just the fear. I get, there's other things happening in these films that is what I'm relating to. And a lot of it has to do with loss and sadness mm -hmm. and stuff, you know? So... I feel like the, yeah, so the book just sort of goes through my childhood, my adolescence, you know, and all these tumultuous things and, and, uh, kind of filters them through discussions of these different films. And then the, at the end of the book, there's a big appendix. It's actually like half the page count of the book, but there's like a big appendix where, uh, it just has like hundreds of capsule reviews about, Film, about these films alphabetically you know so it's oh, like wow. a reference yeah. so just like to nerd out for two seconds your book inspired me to be more personal in my writing i will say because i really want to do like i'm really into like horror writing analysis and academics but also from a personal angle so your book kind of yeah inspired me like oh i can talk about my personal trauma and, and analysis and that's actually a very important perspective in writing yeah. so thank you cool well, thank you <laughs> just, yeah of course and so was it also like a cathartic experience for you to write it, like to kind of put this all to paper in a way and like have it out in the world? Was there any catharsis for you in that experience? I don't know that there was, you know, uh -huh. like, I mean, that was partially why I had that like James Elroy quote at the beginning of the book that says like, you know, I wanted to find the fool who invented closure and shove a big <laughs> closure plaque up his ass because it was yeah. like... And I forget, it's, people often ask me about books that inspired my book in some way or shaped it or influenced me as I was writing it or whatever. And I always forget to mention that James Elroy's My Dark Places was definitely one of those books because it's like a true crime book mm -hmm. about his mother's murder. You know? Oh, wow. And so, you know, he's a known crime writer, but he wrote this like true crime book about his mother's murder and how it shaped who he became as a person and stuff. And so I was reading that book, like, right before writing House of Psychotic Women and stuff. And so that was an influence for sure. But but I felt as though, yeah, after the book, it was not as though... I think it definitely helped. It definitely helped me to see certain patterns. And it also enabled me to know how to use horror films to make myself feel better, you know? But it didn't, like, cure me of oh, my yeah. mental or emotional unbalances or anything Wouldn't like that. Wouldn't that I mean, be nice though if that if our writing actually <laughs> yeah. helped with that? Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess in some ways it was it was definitely helpful to me, but I don't know if it it didn't expunge the right. things that like plague me, you know? Yeah. For sure. And I also want to hear more about the Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies and kind of like what came to you founding the, the this this institute and um where mm -hmm. and all that stuff and like what it is exactly for people who don't know. Okay, so it is I started it in 2010 and it's a it's basically um 
you know, it's not a, it's not an official school. You can't get a degree or anything there. But it's like I wanted to start a way for people to take academic courses in horror taught by academics. Well, not just academics, by academics and people who work in the industry to teach classes about horror because at the time I think it's much more common now for there to be horror classes like in universities and stuff like that but at the time there wasn't a lot of that and so this was a you know this was to kind of make up for what I felt was was lacking in a lot of formal education Mm. um, where there was this real disdain for horror as though it like it didn't matter or something you know so I it originally started as this very like one-off thing back when I lived in Winnipeg I was doing an artist uh, in residence like as I was finishing House of Psychotic Women I was like I had gotten this like residency at this place called Aqua Books to have an office there for like five months to work on my book And as part of doing a residency there, you have to do some sort of project that engages the community in some way. So a lot of authors chose to do readings, you know, from their work in progress or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I felt weird about doing readings kind of like out of out of context from my book. So like it just felt weird to talk about some of the personal stuff like out of context. And then if I were to just read the film analysis parts, they wouldn't be interesting to just a random audience, you know, on their own. Yeah. So it was actually suggested to me by the guy who ran the place. He's like, well, you know, there's spring break is coming up and there's always like activities for young kids, but there's never anything for the kind of 14 year olds and stuff. So why don't you do like a, like a class or a workshop or something about horror movies that the teenagers can come to. And so I was like, okay, I'll do that. And so I called it the Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies. I made like a little ad for it and stuff. But I, but it was kind of a joke. I was just thinking, I'm going to do this thing once. I'm going to call it the Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies. And I'm teaching the class. The class is all about like, it's like horror film criticism for teens is what the class was. And it was hilarious because, you know, I went through, <laughs> I made them read all this stuff from old horror zines like deep red magazine and mm-hmm. eyeball and you know getting them to read different horror critics and then we would watch a movie every day and then they would have to give a criticism of it like they'd have to like write a criticism of it you know and they would have to identify from all these critics that i had exposed them to which one they liked the most of which oh, one cool. they thought reflected the way they would write something the most you know and uh you know and they'd they'd have to write something so I was not a good teacher. I was like very shambolic as a teacher, but that's where the idea came from. And so then I started thinking about, oh, you know, like I'm not a great teacher myself, but I actually know a lot of other people who are, you know, like people who are academics, who, who I know are horror experts and I know are specialists in horror, but they never get to teach horror at their school. You know, right. yeah. they always are teaching other film classes or literature or whatever, but they don't really get to do the horror stuff. So I just was like, I'm going to start getting these people and get them to do classes. And when I, I moved to Montreal and I opened a little micro cinema there. So then I actually had my own venue. So once I had my own venue, we just started doing the classes every Wednesday. So it was like every Wednesday there was a wow. class. And originally it was focused on teenagers, but we just didn't have the outreach to really reach a lot of teenagers, you know, and parents of teenagers. So it ended up being adults, you know, so within the first year, I would say it shifted and then it was just, you know, for adults to come to it, you know, and then it expanded. So then there was a branch in London, in the UK and one in New York. And uh, there's one in Los Angeles that started a couple of years ago. The Montreal one doesn't exist anymore because the people I ran it with there ended up starting a separate thing called, like, since I moved away anyway, they were like, well, we're going to start our own thing and call it something else. So they have a thing called Monstrum that's very similar, but they have a journal and all, you know, they have an actual academic journal and stuff. And, you know, but the London, New York and LA branches of Miskatonic still exist. And I am now on just on the board. So I was the, you know, executive director um, from 2010 to 2021, and then in January of 21, uh, Dr. Sheila Rowan Leg took over as the executive oh, yeah. director. You know Sheila? Okay, I, yeah, yeah, she's really cool. <laughs> so her. I sort of passed the baton to her. So she is the executive director. She's the one who runs it now. Um, and then I'm just on the board. There's I think 12 of us on the board for it. So it's like me and Alexandra Heller Nicholas. <sighs> 
Um, Mm -hmm. a bunch of people, Buddy Giovinazzo is on it, uh, Sean Hogan, all kinds of people. And so we basically just, we'll have a board meeting usually once a year, we'll have like our big board meeting, but then we also have like committees and stuff where we can like give help as needed and stuff. Um, but yeah, so it's an ongoing thing. People want to take classes like during the um, pandemic, they started doing online classes because that's what everybody had to do. And so the online classes did so well with people who aren't normally able to go to our classes because they don't live in those cities um, that as soon as we went back to in-person classes, we decided to keep an online branch going anyway. So we have like the three in-person branches and we have an online branch and they all have different courses. That's so, so cool. That's yeah. so cool. It is so <laughs> cool. I went to one of the, I think I've went, I've gone to a couple of the online ones. Like, I couldn't, I don't live near any of the cities, So it was so cool to get to finally do yeah. one online. So oh, one cool. tiny silver lining for the pandemic. There's more things online now, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so from, you, did you teach any other, did you teach any classes, like any more classes at, at Miskatonic while you were there? I did. I taught, uh, I taught a class on rape revenge films. Mary Beth's favorite. I taught I a love class rape on, <laughs> what did I do? I think I taught a Jallo class. Hell yeah. Um, and I taught a class on like, uh, oh, my, my most popular one was about classroom safety films, actually. Oh, uh-huh. cool. And uh, I also taught a class about, like, plant horror. You know, like, plants either being monsters and killing people or, in some cases, plants, like, solving crimes and stuff. Um, and I did one about, like, airline uh, anxiety. So, like, like mm. travel, uh, mostly, like, 70s kind of, like, air disaster type of films and stuff. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. So, I, have, yeah. I do have a question. What is favorite might be the wrong word, but like favorite rape revenge movie? Probably. I mean, I know it's hard to pick one. I'm sorry. I mean, I think the, I think the best one is Ms. 45, you know, yeah. that, that's the, that's the sort of classic one, but I really, I really like lipstick a lot. Ooh, uh, Lamont lipstick. Johnson film with like, uh, Margot Hemingway and Muriel Hemingway and Chris Sarandon. That one's really good. Uh, there's oh, a yeah. made-for-TV movie. I guess it's not a rape revenge movie, though. It's just a rape movie <laughs> called A Case of Rape with Elizabeth Montgomery that was made for TV. is excellent. I really like, I like, well, like, again, strong word, but I really enjoy reading and writing about rape revenge movies. So I'm always looking for more more yeah. things to where it's re- I find them potentially very interesting yeah. you know yes potentially and is a very good easy- point to put in front of that because they can be done yeah, yeah so because poorly. it's easy to mess it up it's easy to mess it up and just make a crappy exploitive film you know but it but when they are good they are very good you know yeah yeah um okay i could talk to you about <laughs> academic stuff for hours so i'm gonna change the subject so i don't bore terry just me talking Not about bored. horror academia <laughs> and wanting to be an academic and horror um but, uh, Kayla, what movie did you bring with you today for us to discuss? <laughs> yeah, well, when I had to think about, like, a movie that scarred me as a child, um, obviously there's a lot. But there was one that stuck out just because people are always like, what? That movie? <laughs> and that movie is Foul Play from 1978. All right. So, <laughs> Foul Play. Let's read a brief synopsis real quick. A shy San Francisco librarian, played by Goldie Hawn, and a bumbling cop, played by Chevy Chase, fall in love as they solve a crime involving albinos, dwarves, and the Catholic Church. That's yes. from IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I love it when people come with choices that are just like, huh? And so I gotta know, what, <laughs> why is this your Scarred for Life movie? Take us back to when you first saw it. How did you see it? How old were you? Give us your horror story. I got to know. Okay. So I went and saw it at the theater when it came out. Oh, So my dad took me and my brother to see it. So I was six. I remember coming home and telling my mom, oh, my God, dad took us to the scariest movie. And she's like, what movie? And I was like, foul play. She's like, that movie's a comedy. And I'm like, it's a horror movie. And she's like, that movie is not a horror movie. It's a comedy. I'm like, it's a horror movie. And uh, so my mom was like, okay, whatever, you're crazy. But the scene that got me, I watched it again last night. It's still, I still think the first half of the movie is a horror movie. I agree. But anyway. I completely agree. 
<laughs> but the the scene that got me, even though there's many, there's like, you know, beware the dwarf, you know, and the like, just, oh my God. But the thing that scarred me was a scene that I actually remembered incorrectly. Now that I've watched it again, <laughs> I didn't actually remember the scene properly, but there's a scene where Don Calfa, who plays Scarface, mm -hmm. and now that I know who Don Calfa is, it's so much less scary because Don Calfa is known for playing all these, you know, funny characters and stuff. But so I am like six years old. I don't know who Don Calfa is. So it's just like this scary guy with a scar. She's in the bathroom and she's like looking in the mirror. And then next thing you know, like Don Calfa, Scarface, is there trying to kill her mm -hmm. in the bathroom. And in my memory, I remembered him like crawling in the window and oh, then wow. showing up behind her in the mirror. That's actually what happened. What happens for in the movie is actually that she looks in the mirror and then she turns around and he's there and he's in the there. doorway. But what I remembered as a kid was that she's like looking in the mirror doing like her makeup or something and he crawls in the window and then he's behind her in the mirror. That was what I remembered. And so this scene terrified me so much that for years and years later whenever i would get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom i would never flush the toilet <laughs> and my mother every morning would be like why can't you learn to flush the toilet like why are you stupid whatever and so my mom just thought i was like i don't know how to flush the toilet or like i can't remember how to flush it or something but it was like no it's that in the middle of the night when it's quiet the sound of the toilet flushing is so loud that I thought my parents wouldn't be able to hear me screaming when Don Calfa killed me in the bathroom. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, I was like, he's, no. he's in the bathroom and he's going to kill me. And the sound of the toilet flushing is so loud at night <laughs> that they won't hear my screams over the sound of the toilet flushing. And that is a true story. I swear to God, till I was like 12, I never flushed the toilet. <laughs> that might be one of the best Holy shit. stories we've ever had on this podcast i mean yes. perfectly honest with you like that's my favorite that's one of my favorite stories did you explain that to your parents like hey by the way like this is the logic behind it or did you like never i'm positive that i did i'm positive i must have you know rather than having my mom think i'm just stupid but but again, like, she's just like, that movie's not even a horror movie, it's a comedy. And I'm just like, no, it's not, it's horror. The first half is definitely horror, though. Like, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> There's, like, the only thing funny, I mean, the only thing I remember from that age that I thought for sure was funny was Dudley Moore. I thought Dudley Moore was funny, and everything else was terrifying. I may have, I probably laughed when Billy Barty went rolling down the stairs in the garbage <laughs> can also, because I was sick, yeah. you know, uh -huh. but, <laughs> but other than that, I was like, this movie is terrifying. I thought the, the albino was terrifying. The movie's probably very politically incorrect now. Yeah. Too, yeah. But. Yep. <laughs> I did. I did appreciate though, that when uh, a little person actually comes to her door and she calls him the dwarf, he like politely cor corrects her saying, you know, we yeah. don't like being called that. We like being called little people, a little person. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So the movie at least is, is aware of that. But, um, yeah, I, okay. But also it's very aware of like the like Goldie Hawn's friend who's like constantly warning her about like rape culture and like I know. you know yes. I, was, I was like is this uh where she's just like she's like rape is not sex rape violence. is violence you know and I was like that's that's pretty early for a mainstream film to make that distinction. I was you know? thinking about that a lot. Like how she's like, you need to have like pepper spray and this like this loud alarm and brass knuckles. Like the you screamer. need to have, which is all yeah. things you think like, oh, those weren't in, like women weren't thinking about that and carrying these things until like way later. But this movie is very much at the very beginning. Just like, no, don't trust a man. I do think that in 1978, Absolutely. You know, there was like a lot of radical feminism and there yeah. was a lot of the beginning of the take back the night movement yeah. and stuff mm -hmm. is like in the late 70s. And so there there absolutely were those conversations happening. But for a movie as mainstream yeah. as yes. foul play, that's what makes me think it's unusual. Like oh, it's yeah. unusual that they're that tapped into the conversation, you know, at that time, yeah. considering how mainstream the movie was. 
Exactly. I loved how Stella said, nobody's going to mess with Stella unless Stella wants to be messed. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> she's a great, great little character. Well, in this whole movie, yeah. I feel like Goldie Hawn, I mean, it's obviously a very classic case of like wrong, like wrong place at the wrong time kind of situation. But a lot of it also, especially with Stella's talk at the beginning, sort of about like about rape and protecting yourself. It felt a lot like this movie is Goldie Hawn constantly evading predatory, disgusting men and how like these men are everywhere and how she just, no matter where she goes, she is haunted, followed, and always in like, peril from men. And I was like, okay. And it obviously gets a little bit sillier yeah. and romantic towards the, the back half, but at the first half, again, it's just like, everything is incredibly unsafe for her, a woman against all of these men who are after her for one reason or another. And I was, yeah. again... And even, like, even the cops, because you have like the first guy who gets in the car with her, who I wouldn't have known this as a kid, but who is, who is the cop from Mar the TV show Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. You know, he, you think he, you think he's like a killer or whatever. Like it's, he's yeah. set up as a dangerous character. You don't find out till later that he's a cop, you know, undercover. Um, and so he feels like a very dangerous, sketchy character himself. Um, and then Chevy Chase even, you know, he's like, I'm going to come to your house and tuck you in. And do you want me to carry you carry to bed you or whatever? Right. But one of the things that stuck out to me, this time around. And actually, it, it stuck out to me then, too. I just wouldn't have had the language or, or experience to articulate it. Is that Dudley Moore's character is clearly, you know, a pervert. But he's a totally normalized, harmless pervert. And I really liked that, you know, that it was <laughs> like, there is a way to be a pervert. And not be threatening to women, you know, because when Goldie Hawn realizes that he thinks that they're going to hook up and he's got his swinging bachelor pad happening and she's like, Stanley, what are you doing? <laughs> he's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I misunderstood. And he he apologizes up. right away. Mm -hmm. He like, he's like hands off. Like he's just, but he, yeah, he just is like backs off right away. She's not remotely scared of him or anything. And I was like, that's interesting, too, you know, that it's like the film is full of predatory men, but there's also a space in this world for a pervert who doesn't mean anybody any harm. I, you know, I love that scene. You're just excited for someone to also like, like voyeurism, like him with the binoculars. Yeah. Oh, you like he's binoculars? Like, binoculars too. <laughs> and he's like so excited that there's someone else that he can share that with. And he's just like, ter and he's just so happy. <laughs> And then, yeah, oops. But yeah, yeah, Terry. so sad. What were you saying? Sorry. Well, what kills me about this scene is that, like, I'm watching this going, oh, I know where Mike Myers got his idea for Austin Powers, because this sequence is totally Austin Powers with the shag pad. I expected him yeah. to say, do I make you horny, babe? Like, I expected him <laughs> just to say that, right? Do I make you randy? Like, that's what I expected to come out of his mouth at this in this scene, because it's yeah. just like, it's one thing after another, the bed coming out of the door with, like, uh, naked women behind it, the, the, the sex closet that has helium-filled uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, blow up dolls. <laughs> the yeah. music, the 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 lights, the disco ball that's sending light. Like it's just, it's so much. But it reminded I, me yeah. so much of Austin Powers. Well, when I was a kid, I mean, I guess Airplane came out later. You know, Airplane is a couple of years later. But that to me is like an airplane gag. Mm -hmm. You know, like of the whole movie, that's the scene that comes off as like the kind of. Like some kind of Zucker Brothers joke, you know. It goes on for an extended me point of time too. I was like, "This, they are yeah. really committing to this bit." <laughs> yeah. Well, it was probably expensive to make yeah. that bed and everything, so they had to that use bed. it. <laughs> that bed. I loved his character. Yeah. I just—he's a great. Like, I know it's a comedy, but he felt like the biggest co comedic relief part when he just kept appearing, and oh, yeah. I was like, "Absolutely, Stanley." Wow. He's the only part that, like I said, he's the yeah. only part I thought was funny. Because, like, even Chevy Chase, he says everything with a straight face, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, when I was a kid, I didn't understand that the things he said were funny. Like, so when he says to her the first time he meets her, and he's like, I don't remember what his character name is, but he's like, you know, hi, I'm Charlie. Do you want to take a shower? 
I was like, oh, that's a pickup line. That's what men say to women when they meet them. Like, oh, okay. You know, like I was six years old. I'm thinking, oh, that's what men and women talk about when they're alone, when they're grown up, you know, is they take showers together. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like, I didn't think that was a joke. You know, I just thought that was like normal. That's what adults talk like to each other. So (laughs) the the humor in this is is kind of... um... Not muted, but it is a little bit more drier. Like, it, there's a quote I found from Higgins, the the director, who says that like it's tongue in cheek realism. The audience is in on the joke, but the actors must carry on as if they are they were unaware. And I think that yeah. like I I do watching this as an adult, I see a lot of the sly bits of humor in here, particularly with the misunderstandings, the constant misunderstandings where. Uh, Scotty comes into the movie theater and he's like, beware the dwarf. And she's like, I don't think there's any dwarves in this. Like, she's totally (laughs) missing the fact that he is bleeding out into her popcorn. Okay, I also love that image of the blood dropping on the popcorn. I want more movies to have Mm -hmm. blood going into popcorn. (laughs) Well, that also... Just sorry, sorry, Terry. One more, one thing. It felt like, again, Scream 2 is obviously very later down the line, but you just see, like, whispers of, like, horror movies in the future. And, like... I yeah. I am woefully like have not watched a lot of things past a certain point. I'm much more of a contemporary focused film. So watching movies like this, it's like, oh shit. I'm like understanding, I think, where influences are coming from and things like that. And it's really cool to kind of be piecing together yeah. that horror history. And I know this isn't like a yeah. horror movie, but still. No, but there are moments. Like yeah. it, we even get a slasher moment where Goldie Hawn is being chased in the in the library and she goes running up the stairs and throws the cart down. Yeah. I'm like, that is totally a scene that, uh, that we see in a uh, scream movies later on, right? Yeah. Where they are running upstairs and they're actually actively trying to stop the the killer from getting them by throwing things at yeah. them. Like I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that is a prototypical like proto slasher movie moment right there. Yeah, but just the way that I mean and it's like the guy didn't the guy who write and direct this also write Harold and Maud. Yes, he did. I was which going on like a dive of all of the things. This guy also directed <laughs> nine to five and nine to five. And um the best little whorehouse in Texas. I, yeah, I wonder if he had some connection to Dolly Parton. I don't know because they're both Dolly Parton movies. But wild, and I mean, he he wrote a couple more, like you, like you said, Harold and Maude, and some movie called The Devil's Daughter and Silver Streak. But yeah, only three yeah. movies directed. It's uh, yeah. it's wild. I've not actually seen the other two though, Nine to Five or Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. I've oh yeah, I saw those. I saw well, I saw Nine to Five in the theater for sure, and Best Little Horror House I saw, but I think I may have seen that on video or cable or something. But. That was definitely a movie my parents would not have rented for me because of the, it had the word horror. <laughs> oh yeah, because of the, the, yeah, the title. Of the title. <laughs> Uh huh. Yes. But I remember loving nine to five when I was little. Though I loved Dolly Parton. I mean, I still love Dolly Parton. But like, I loved Dolly at that age, you know. And she was just ubiquitous. You know, she was just on. She was in movies, and she was like on TV shows and just everything. So, um, yeah. I but I love nine to five because I love the just the revenge scenario of that. Also, okay. So there's a MacGuffin in this movie, and. I love that this MacGuffin, the, the, the cigarette box that has a piece of film in it that has been undeveloped and yeah. is why they're chasing after her for half the movie. And then yeah. it sort of like gets like hidden in her apartment on accident. Esme, a snake, tries to alert people to it. He's obsessed with that yeah. snake, by the way. <laughs> and then eventually it just gets thrown in the trash, like in the fire. And it gets yeah. burned up in the fireplace. And it's like... It's never utilized. Never yeah. utilized. And I I mean, in the, you know, that is like a, a, a typical MacGuffin. But the fact that it not only is not utilized, it has absolutely no importance. It's never mentioned and it gets burned up. Just like, it, it's really kind of funny to me. Like, that is one of those little slide bits well, of humor yeah, that I that's was like... Gotta be, I mean, that's obviously like a deliberate joke you know so yeah that's very funny because obviously <laughs> you expect that at some point the bit you're you're gonna have the scene where what's on the film is exposed and whatever and it's like no nope, it just burns up in the just- fire no one ever discovers <laughs> it <laughs> Well, I love never you, mentioned again. I love when they introduce the yeah. snake when it's like you always see a mysterious snake in a mm. horror movie is always going to like come and bite you and be some scary thing. And then he's just like, oh, Esme, get off the table. And she's just slithering over a plate of cookies and Goldie Hawn picks her up. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I, I, I feel like this movie really does play again with those like kind of horror expectations a little bit of like, oh, a crime mm-hmm. thriller, all of these bad things happening. And it's 
everything is like more innocuous than you think, which again, I loved very much to see these kind of subverting tropes a little bit. Yeah. But also, yeah, it's like, it, it's, it's again, normalizing the unusual, you know, like yeah. sort of like the deadly more, you know, where it's kind of like presenting you something that seems unusual and then presenting it as being like totally harmless. Or the opposite way, because I love Mr. Hennessy. Played by Bur- uh, Bur- Burgess Meredith. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who, uh, yeah. you know, at the very beginning of the movie, it's played for a joke where he's like, you scream, I'll run up there and I'll kick some ass. And yeah. it's like, you're a little old man. That's, you know, that's funny. And by the end of the movie, he is literally like martial <laughs> artsing his way through the bad guys. And it's like, yes. it's such a, it's a funny little reversal. And of course, you know, people know him from from Rocky as Mickey and Rocky. So yeah. like, he had that going into this uh, this mm-hmm. movie. But like, it's just, it's so funny to me that this little old man is like, I'll kick their ass. You're like, haha, this, he's so cute. And then, no, yeah. he literally is handing them it's their ass. It's funny that you're like, people know him from Rocky. Because, like, I think of him as, like, the guy from the Twilight Zone episode where he's, like, the last person alive. And he's, oh, like, that's a, right. he's like, a bibliophile. And he just wants to read and read and read all day. And then he's finally left the last person alive on the planet. And he breaks his glasses. Breaks his glasses. Oh, my God. I didn't know that was him. I remember, <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen that episode in a long time. But uh, that's yeah. one of my favorites from as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. Wow. Yeah, he's like he's in so much great stuff. And his granddaughter, he has a granddaughter who has an account on Twitter who posts about him all the time and posts Aww. all kinds of like anecdotes about him, rare photos, like she's really interested in like preserving his legacy and stuff like that. So. Wait, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. So, I want to talk about the actual like crime or plot in the middle of this because I definitely was like a smidge lost at some point (laughs) about like the Catholic church and taxing the church and all of that stuff. Yeah. Because it it devolves into this like crazy plot, like huge conspiracy plot (laughs) when we think it's about cigarettes and undeveloped film and actually it's about killing the Pope. Right? Did I get right with that, right? But (laughs) I actually, but, but, but now that you mention it, I watched the movie I don't know, de- definitely less than 24 hours ago, I cannot tell you what the plot of the <laughs> movie is. I cannot tell you what the conspiracy is. That makes me feel better, because I was like, am I? I'm a, as confused as you about, like, okay, so why did they want to kill the Pope? <laughs> all I got, all I got from this <laughs> is they are tax the church league, they went to prison... Because they tried to kidnap Billy Graham. Uh-huh. They want to kill the Pope because they think that organized religion is stealing from the people, I believe. So the so the bad guys are good? See? That's, that was wait, my thing. That was my thing as well. I was like, wait, <laughs> they wanting they talk about how the church is corrupt and how they want to like keep them from stealing money from people. And I was like, wait, why are they bad? <laughs> What's wrong with that? That sounds fine to me. <laughs> but there were, but yeah, okay. He's it's, the symbol of the confusing. power and wealth of the world's churches, and they hide behind the skirts, behind the sham of organized religion, whose aim is to rob spirituality. Tonight's the start of a revolution long overdue, and they talk about how it's the historically proven path to revolution is through violence. And yes. that's why they want to shoot and kill the Pope. I mean, now that you're saying this, I mean, I remember all these things being said, but it's <laughs> kind of like, I just, I still don't feel that it's convincing no. that no. the dwarf and Whitey Jackson and his crew are like <laughs> doing all this because they want to cause a revolution against the church. You know? Yeah, that part. That is not convincing as a thesis. No. <laughs> No, you know, need some work. I, yeah, yeah. I, they kept introducing more and more bad guys, and I was like, "Wait, I'm sorry. Who is the like?" I had a hard time. Who keeping is the dwarf? Straight. Who is the per- like the albino guy? Who is this? So like, is who the, are all these guys? The dwarf, the dwarf is not a, actually dwarf. a dwarf. The dwarf is is played by Mark Lawrence. Yes, yeah, so it's a code um, name. Who's like you know like a noir actor, and um, <laughs> he has a movie in my house of psychotic women movie called Pigs that he like wrote and directed oh, and stars in. Oh, cool. Um, but. Yeah, so the dwarf that, you know, when he says beware the dwarf, who he's talking about is not actually a dwarf, is just a person whose nickname is the dwarf. Which, and- <laughs> which, okay, so I have a question about that too, because early on, that reveal was like, I, I sat there for a moment, I was like, I had to look up, I was like, okay, no, that is the character Rupert Stiltskin. And I was like, but 
earlier in the movie, there's a moment where, like, one of the librarians tells uh, Goldie Hawn's character, you know, the little man came to see you. Yeah. And I'm thinking, she's not wait. Refer- she's not referring to him. Right. Billy so, Barty. That's Billy has Barty. He, was he, like, stalking her from the, the library and then went to her house to sell Bibles? Yes, I know. That makes no <laughs> sense either. What Bible salesman's going to go to your work at the library and then come to your house? It's like... I mean, he does say that, like, he's really bad at his job because people find him annoying. And I'm sorry, if you're showing up at my work and then you're also following me home, yes, you probably are a little annoying. But that yeah. that that revelation, I was like, wait... Was he really stalking her her job to sell Bibles? Yeah, well, I mean... Gotta make a living. And also, again, predatory men. Men are weird. They do all that weird shit to... Well, and also predatory church. Predatory church? Predatory church. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, very interesting that this is very much... Is it pro-religion? I don't even know if it knows what it is, honestly. Uh, No. (laughs) I think it might just be like... I don't know, here's a weird plot. But this is also nominated for a bunch of Golden Globes. Like, and it was also nominated for Best Original Song, I think, for the, an Academy Award. Yeah, oh, Academy the Award for, yeah, the, Barry for the Barry, yeah. Barry Manilow song, <laughs> which I was like, oh, Barry Manilow. Yeah. But no, this the Golden Globes, Best Motion Picture, Best Actor in a Motion Picture, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, Best Screenplay, Best Original Song, Bless, uh, Best Motion Picture Acting Debut. For who? Who's Acting uh, Debut? Che- Chevy Chase. Oh, oh, this really? was Chevy okay. Chase's yes. debut. Oh, debut feature film. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense because like he doesn't. He's not playing the usual character I'm used to seeing Chevy Chase play. I feel like he's much. He's less of a dickhead, a little bit. Not by <laughs> yeah. much, but like a little bit less of a dickhead. <laughs> um, a little softer than I think he. We see him than I've seen him like in later movies. Yeah, he's but... a he's a little suave, a little with moments of yeah. klutziness, like I, I, yeah. at the very beginning, and then on on the houseboat when he's like, "Careful, you don't want to fall," and then he falls overboard right. in the yeah, water. He's, sorry, he the way he speaks is a little yeah, suave. suave. The way mm-hmm. he moves through the world is not very suave. Yes. No. He's got like a little <laughs> bit more game, a little bit more game than his other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do think that's sort of his charm in these early movies, though, is that sort of like person that that wants to be debonair, but then yeah. knocks over a table full of drinks. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that I that that stuck out to me as I was watching this is like, did Dan Brown steal plot points for the Da Vinci Code from this movie? <laughs> because. <laughs> In the Da Vinci Code, there is an albino monk that is like an assassin going around killing people. It all is about the church. I'm like, huh. did he steal I have from not, this? I have not read or seen the movie of the Da Vinci Code. So I have unfortunately seen I'll, the movie. Maybe I'll have to watch I it read, now. I read and the book. Paul, I did, in fact, read Paul the Paul Bettany plays the uh, the uh, albino monk. That is huh. interesting. That self-flagellates. That's very... I had, you mentioned this to me before I watched it, and I had forgotten you said that. And now that it's very interesting, the weird <laughs> anti-comedy yeah. look at that would be. But, I mean, obviously, that would be a very funny influence for that book to have. So, Or I don't know if that's an element in the book as well as in the movie, but... No Goldie Hawn, unfortunately. No. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> What is the obsession in this movie with warm milk? That was another yeah, question I, I, I had. I don't know. It's like, yeah, drinking milk. Everybody drinks milk, which is very strange. It's. Just, I think it's just one of... I mean, I don't know. I just assumed it's just a gag. You know, it's just mm-hmm. a running gag. You know, like something for you to notice. Like, why is everybody drinking milk? Um, like an in-joke that made them laugh as they were making the movie. Uh, but I don't know whether there's any significance to that other than you know, implying a certain innocence, you know, on behalf of the characters, like, oh, they're milk drinkers, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, like, it did, it definitely, like, made everyone seem a little bit younger, when it was like, I made you some warm mm. milk yeah. on the stove, and I'm like, what is happening? Like, the to- I feel like the tone just, like, <laughs> oscillates quite a bit with this movie, and it's, but it's, I mean, it's fucking entertaining, I will say that. It is, keeps you on your toes a little bit, I feel like. The, uh, the the finale of this movie also just kind of kills me. The the extended car chase of them trying to get to the <laughs> opera house involving like a car crashing into an Italian restaurant, stealing a truck with a house on it, stealing a limo <laughs> with Japan with ja- two Japanese gentlemen in the back that uh, finally like catch on when they say what was it Kojak was it Kojak Bang Some- Bang yes. Yeah. Or, yes, I think something like that. And they were like, and they're like, oh, okay. And that was what finally caught them on. And then the reveal: Stanley is the conductor. <laughs> yes. 
Stanley the Amazing. Conductor. That, that was my favorite part. I was like, Stanley, Full my man, circle. you're here. Like, <laughs> it's actually his yes. movie, everybody. It's Stanley's movie. <laughs> yeah, it's oh, just bizarre. Like, this film. big, like, production of the Mikado at the, you know, at the end of the movie. <laughs> But as they're shooting and, and having a gunfight backstage and, and they're yeah. continuing to sing on. And then the final thing comes down with the dead bodies on and the post. Yeah, it's like the end of class of 1984, you know, yes. where it's like they're all doing the concert. And then, you know, Stegman comes hanging down in the middle of the finale. It's just it's it's just wild. This movie was was absolutely wild. Yeah, incredible pick. Very excited that I got to watch this wildly <laughs> entertaining ride. Yeah. That is very hard to find on the on the internet. Yeah. Is it hard say. to find? No. Yeah, it's not really anywhere. <laughs> so I thought it just came out again recently, but um but yeah, it was just like but that it was funny watching it again and watch, you know, that scene knowing that scene is coming up with Scarface and then being like Oh, weird. It just, it doesn't actually unfold how I remembered it. You know, like, I also didn't remember Scarface talking, you know, mm. I just remember him as like a scary monster, you yeah. know, and then watching it again as an adult, he's just like a normal dude talking and whatever. And I'm like, wow, I had like my, his, my version of him in my imagination was so much scarier. It's, it's, I think it's always interesting when like you reapproach some movies as an adult and you have like a specific memory of that movie and then you watch it and it's, that's not how that happened at all. <laughs> and it's, it's always, it's, it's the idea, I guess like the fallibility of memory is always, always interesting yeah. to me about revisiting things. Like I, there was like a line in a movie and I can't remember what it was now that for the longest time I would quote and I finally would watch the movie 20 years later and it's like, oh, that line is not even very close to what was said in the movie <laughs> but wow. for the longest time i thought that was literally the line yeah. it's just yeah yeah uh what a wild one <laughs> well should we wrap up and give this a rating out of five sounds good all right terry how many insignificant MacGuffins out of five <laughs> do you give foul play you know this uh I I I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I was going to i remember the one thing i do remember is when i was a kid i remember seeing this uh the the VHS cover of Chevy Chase uh, with like the gun sticking out where his crotch should be firing <laughs> and Goldie Hawn above him. And I just remember laughing at this as a kid going, Oh, that's, that's, that's funny. Cause and just juvenile humor. Right. But like, i never saw the movie until yesterday. It was my very first time, but I saw that <laughs> poster and I was like, I remember this as a kid. I have a very vivid memory of seeing that, that as a kid, but yeah, I, you know, this, this movie is uh I think there's some surprising things in it in terms of the humor. Uh, it's obviously a riff on Hitchcock. Like you can sort of see a lot of the, the sort of people in peril that have like the innocent person in peril that, that uh, Hitchcock did a whole lot of 39 steps, saboteur North by Northwest, that kind of stuff, man who knew too much, like all of those types of stuff are being lampooned here. And it's, it's funny. It's um, sorry. My power is flickering. So I keep going like this because the oh. power is flickering. So just keep going. Sorry. That's why I keep looking around <laughs> very confused because the power is flickering on and off. Yeah. Beware the dwarf. Just, Beware the dwarf. There's a closet right here. Uh oh. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, Terry. <laughs> Hopefully there's no Scarface crawling through your window. Shut up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, but this was this was a really enjoyable. Uh, I'm uh, three and a half. I'm going to cut one of those MacGuffins in half, and I guess toss the rest into the the fireplace. Three and a half for me. What about you, Mary Beth? I'm going to also give it three and a half. I think. I mean, like, t I had never heard of this movie. Sorry, I'm a baby. Um, <laughs> but I always have a uh, an excuse to watch uh, a young Goldie Hawn, and oh, she's so she's hot just an incredible actor. <laughs> and so I want her in more horror movies. But I love her, so it was very good to see her in this. It was very twisty and turny in a way that I wasn't expecting. And again, like I had. A lot of JV Chase sometimes rubs me the wrong way because I think he's kind of an asshole. So it, I was like, okay, this didn't make me as annoyed with him as I have been in the past with movies with him. But I, I really, I had a great time watching this. But Kayla, you have the final word. How many insignificant MacGuffins out of five do you give foul play? Okay, so I'm not thinking of actual insignificant MacGuffins. This is like a rating of the yes, movie. Yes, a rating of yeah. the movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, well, there's one really big insignificant <laughs> MacGuffin. <laughs> but I'm like, so I was like, why aren't you guys just giving it one? Is there another? Is there like 2.5 more? 
<laughs> MacGuffins I didn't see. Did you not see um, all the MacGuffins hiding around? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I would say three. I feel as though the the beginning is really strong. I think it devolves yeah. into chaos, like in the end, where yes. clearly we were two of the three of us were totally confused about what was even happening. So um, I just took copious notes. Otherwise, I, I was like, what happened? <laughs> Yeah, I would give it a three. I just, yeah, because I love, I feel like it's so strong for like the first half. And it's like, it's still very scary, very, the timing of everything is great. Um, and then I feel like it starts to get sillier in the mm-hmm. second half in a way that I don't like appreciate as much. Yeah. That first half is a really, a really good neo-noir type comedy. Like it, yeah. it just understands that, that subgenre so well. And then it just, yeah, I agree. It kind of devolves after that. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Kayla, for introducing us to this movie. Where can our listeners find you and what do you have coming up that you can share and talk about? Well, they can find, if you can spell my name, which is impossible, you can get to my website, which is kaylajanice.com. <laughs> So, what happened in the show? So, notes, I don't y'all. know how helpful that is if you can't spell my name. Um, but uh, and then all my projects and my calendar of events and everything are there. And I guess in terms of what I have upcoming, it's really going to be House of Psychotic Women book launch events for the next couple of months. So I'm going to be at the Sitges Film Festival in Spain in the beginning of October. I'm going to be at Horrorama in Toronto next weekend interviewing Lance Kerwin on stage um, from Salem's Lot. So that's going to be very exciting. Yeah, I'll be in LA doing a couple of events in mid-October and I'm doing a UK tour in um, in the last week of October and early November. So yeah, so it's just a bunch of House of Psychotic Women events coming up. Awesome. So, and the, when is the book going to be available? So the book is available now from direct from the publisher. So if okay. you get it from Fab Press, you can actually just go on their website and order it now. Um, and it comes with a limited edition CD of a spoken word album in it. Ooh. And that is me reading the yellow wallpaper with like an original score. Oh, uh, and that, But the one that goes to bookstores and on Amazon and everything like that, I think it's like October 4th. That okay. it comes out wide, like on Amazon and everything. But I believe you can actually pre-order it on Amazon already. Like I think there's I already there. you mm-hmm. can find it there already and like pre-order it and stuff. So October fourth is when it goes wide. Um, and yeah, I I hope people check it out and like it. So Hell yeah. it's the greatest, guys. You have to read it. Sorry, it's a being a nerd and not being a professional, but <laughs> it's a very important book to me. Anyway, uh, so wrestlers, you've heard from us, but we want to hear from you. What was your experience with foul play? You can send us an email at scarredforlifepodcast at gmail.com, or you can reach out to us directly on Twitter. I am at MB McAndrews. And I'm at Gailey Dreadful. And of course, don't forget to follow the podcast on Twitter at Scarred Podcast. And please don't forget to review, rate, and subscribe. And uh, if you want, join our Patreon to help support us. Thank you to Eric Parr for our artwork. Thank you to Sean Keller for our music. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please stay safe out there. But most importantly, stay creepy. And until next time.